of the show last night rallied around you. They were saying thank you as well. You think so, girls? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That felt really good. Well, we just have just a few minutes with each of our new Hall of Fame inductees. What motivated you to dive in and plow new ground? Well, uh, I wasn't thinking of it in terms of plowing new ground at the time. I mean, a lot of that's sort of in retrospect. But uh, I just loved the music. And I, we were, I was living around Washington, D.C., <coughs> And Hazel was living in Baltimore, and, and we got to know one another, and we were part of that whole uh, group of people who were just like, oh, yeah, we love this music. And it was everywhere, because the people who had moved up from the South uh, to get factory jobs around Baltimore mainly, uh, they brought their music with them. So it was everywhere, every, every bar in Baltimore, practically. In, any corner bar had a bluegrass band. <laughs> And um, and they're, they're out around in the country. There were there was bluegrass music. The country gentlemen, Tom Gray, were playing at the uh, Shamrock. Remember the Shamrock mm -hmm. Bar and Grill in Georgetown. And um, it was just everywhere. And so that's all we did. If we had a party, it, there was music. We didn't sort of stand around and drink cocktails and talk. We played music. <laughs> and um, so we were learning and absorbing everything. And it just became my life. Tell us about Hazel. Well, the first, uh, there was this, this friend of mine who later became my husband, Jeremy Foster, um, had met Hazel who through Mike Seeger. He was a, he was a, it's complicated, he was a, a boyhood friend of Mike's. They went to high school together and <coughs> And Mike had introduced him to Hazel, and Jeremy said to me at some point, there's this little girl with this great big voice, and you've got to meet her. <laughs> so we did meet, and that sure did. I mean, she was, you know, a little skinny Hazel with a great big voice. And uh, we got to be friends first, and um, she taught me a lot. She was my first influence. Her her voice was amazing. And I said, that's what I'd like to sing like. And I was listening to a lot of women like Wilma Lee Cooper and, yeah, and uh, Molly O'Day and Ola Bell Reed and, gosh, on and on, as well as Bill Monroe and the Stanley Brothers. And uh, just taking it all in and hoping it came out this way. When you started working and doing public performances and appearances, which was it just a duo? Uh, it became a duo. No, we, we were playing with other people. Uh, Lamar Greer was, had, has been a longtime friend, and, and uh, so he would play with us a lot. But we became a duo when we went on this particular tour that was sponsored by this, uh, a woman by the name of Anne Romaine from Gastonia, North Carolina, and she was working in the South with Bernice Regan, who was the co-founder of Sweet Honey and the Rock, and they were working in the civil rights movement in Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, and they got this idea to start a tour which would take traditional musicians and go around the South, which was a very novel idea at that time because uh, they were discovering, you know, Roscoe Holcomb and Doc Box and different people, Cousin Emmy, and taking them up to the Newport Folk Festival, the Philadelphia Folk Festival, the New York Friends of Old Time Music, but there, it, there wasn't, um, they weren't living again in the South, so that they felt it was important to take traditional music ar around to their own home communities. And it was an integrated tour of black and white musicians, and she asked Hazel and I to be on it. And um, it, was, it was amazing. I mean, they had people like Roscoe Holcomb, uh, Doc Watts and Ola Bell Reed, um, Johnny Shines, Mabel Hillary, Bessie Jones, I mean, on and on and on. And we'd travel around in a van, but because they didn't have a lot of money to spend, we couldn't take a, or space in the van, we couldn't take a whole band, so we had to kind of develop something that the two of us could do, so I was like 
Okay, well, let me see if I can play the auto harp a little bit. So I've played the auto harp and sometimes the banjo. I even played the harmonica and once learned one song on the harmonica. And then Hazel, who usually played bass, would play guitar. And that's how we sort of became a, more of a duo at that, because during that time, yeah. Who in, in, in bluegrass music was the biggest encouragement to you two? Well, Bill Monroe for sure. He, he really was. He, uh, he was very encouraging to us. He, he liked us, and I, I think, you know, he just he wanted to encourage us. And he's the one that, I remember the day, he was actually at my house that day, and he said, you know, I've got this song. I think you girls could really do a good job on it. That I've heard called, the one I love, and that's where the one I love is gone came from. He, he showed us that, and we said, oh yeah, we gotta do this song. Later on, we wrote a second verse to it, but it didn't get on the <laughs> record at the time. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> well, you now tell us about the greatest challenges that you faced as pioneering female artist. Well, I think Hazel probably initially faced more challenges than I did at that time. <coughs> she was the girl bass player, you know, and she played with different people around in the Baltimore area. And at, at that time, you know, it was like, well, okay, let's, we'll get the girl singer to sing one song. So she'd sing a Katie Wells song and then go back to playing the bass. And that was kind of the way it was. <coughs> oh, thank you. Um, that the, around in our personal group of friends, we didn't get that. They, they really, our, our group around D.C., including Kuykendall, Lamar, other people in the area, Dick Spots, they, they were so encouraging of us. But it was sort of further out, a little further afield that, you know, you, you sense this kind of shut out sort of feeling from, from the general bluegrass scene. So that, that, you know, that was a little difficult. And I, you know, I didn't, you sort of feel it at the time, and it's, but it was sort of later that we became much more conscious of it as, as uh, women's liberation movement grew and we became a little more, oh yeah, this isn't, this isn't right. <laughs> Let's go for it. What's the, the best moment you had in your performing and recording career? When did you guys say, yeah, we've made it? And, and we're making a mark, and we're making a difference. When did you get that satisfaction? I feel like it came sort of later. We got, Hazel and I got together for a, we re regrouped for a tour on the West Coast in the 1980s. And I think that's when it really sort of hit home. Uh, that we, there was, some history there we, that was important. The, but the very first time that we sort of had an inkling was <laughs> we were up in Boston and we walked into this place where we were playing and it was filled, the room was just filled with mostly women. And they were sitting on the ground and, they were, and we said, oh man, this is great, What's going, there's something going on. We, but we weren't, it was like, something's going on, but I'm not sure what it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was at the same time that somebody came up to me and said, I just come from this women's liberation movement. And I said, what's women's liberation? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but it was kind of, I think during the, the for me anyway, the, that sort of reunion tour kind of brought it home to us. It was a great tour. We'll change topic just a little bit here because we have a, a remote connection. I'm from southwestern Ohio, and, and as, as uh, Alice was talking about the Baltimore, D.C. area really being a, a, a booming environment for bluegrass in the 50s and 60s because of the Appalachian migration, if they didn't go to Baltimore, D.C., they came to Dayton and Cincinnati. Uh, few of them made it all the way to Chicago or Detroit, but man, there are thousands that landed in Dayton and Cincinnati. And there's, in the lobby here at the convention center, we have a beautiful display that was facilitated by Miami University and our friend Fred Bartenstein and, and a team of others.
which chronicle the, the Appalachian migration to Dayton and Cincinnati and all the bluegrass history that we enjoy in our area. And you helped make a big chunk of that history. How did you wind up in Yellow Springs, Ohio? Well, you know, this, you know that's, I met your dad there too. Um, uh, I went to school for a while until I dropped out at Antioch College in Yellow Springs. And um, there, there, we were very aware that it was, there were a lot of people who had migrated down from Kentucky who lived in that area and, and they had a little, I remember having a, they had a little banjo contest nearby one time. And there were two people, me and, and another guy, and I won. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough. <laughs> and so, so it was, yeah, it, that was kind of a, it was the same, but it had the, sort of the same thing there in that area, Dayton, uh, Yellow Springs uh, area. As they did around Baltimore where people from Kentucky migrated down there to get jobs and people from uh, North Carolina and Southwest Virginia migrated up to the Baltimore area to get jobs. And they brought, everybody brings their music when they, when they go. They bring their cultural selves to. How did you get a, a, blue, a authentic bluegrass concert onto the Antioch campus? And I've mentioned this specifically because I think it's pretty documented as the very first bluegrass concert on a college campus was in 1960, um, right there at Yellow Springs at Antioch. That's right. I, I was talking with Bobby about that last night. He, he remembered it. He remembered, well, my husband and I were very, well, he wasn't my husband at the time, my boyfriend, and I were just into the music. We wanted to kind of get it out there. We loved it and wanted the other people to love it. And uh, I said, I don't know, why don't we see if we can get the student council to bring a band in? So the first band was the Osborne Brothers, and they came. And... <laughs> They, they had a little bit of a hard time. If you know anything about Antioch College, it's kind of a uh, very a lot, a lot of beards and sandals and hippie kind of people and left-wing politics and stuff like that. So and so the Osmond brothers get up there and they're doing their regular shtick, and they were trying to connect with the audience and they'd say, "Does anybody here like baseball?" Silence. <laughs> <laughs> How about football? Silence. And it went kind of like that for a while. And I think it was, Bobby was reminding me that Neil Rosenberg was there, because Neil went to Oberlin, and he came, to, he had a, a little band, they would come down and we could get together. And <laughs> Neil suggested that Bobby play some stuff like Pretty Polly and things like that that would be more akin to folk music. And he did that, and pretty soon, they started connecting, that like people could identify a little more. With it. And, and then, oh well, yeah, the other thing that Bobby said that I remember. Yeah, well, we like to play a little something to satisfy everybody. You know, and that was like titter, titter, titter from the audience. <laughs> they didn't grab on the concept. So, but it was, it was very interesting, and, and we had a great time. And then we got, the next time we got a band, it was the Stanley Brothers. It came with Lindy Clear playing bass. And I'll never forget the little, Thing Lendy did with the fiddle where he took the hair, separated it from the frog, and put it over the thing and, and did this imitation of a little old lady in church with a ham like it was so beautiful. Oh man, he was a great musician. Okay. <laughs> Tell us something else about Hazel. Tell us uh, what motivated her songwriting. Because it came from a deep spot, didn't it? Yes, it did. It really did. And my feeling is, you know, and I, I don't really like speaking for Hazel, but since she's not, can't speak for herself right now, um, I think that it was those tours. I mean, I think it existed in her before then, but I think the tours that we did around the South under uh, Anne Romaine's leadership sort of gave her permission to speak in a certain kind of way. It validated what she was feeling already, and it encouraged her to speak, because Anne was a very supportive and encouraging person who 
wanted us to do our best and to speak out on things that we wanted to speak out on. So we started writing songs. She she did before I did, and and I but I think that the whole and you know it was a you know we were in we went to Eastern Kentucky and we were in coal mining regions there and stayed in communities on the tour and and we're very aware and talked with local people about conditions. At that time, it was strip mining that people were fighting against. And now it's mountaintop removal. And we talked to the local people and, you know, yet somebody's well had been, their water, they didn't have any drinking water because their well had been ruined by runoff from strip mining and stuff like that. And just our consciousness got, got really raised by being on those tours. And uh, but I think that it just, it was kind of like it validated what was deep in her and gave her permission to speak out. And I think that's one of the, a big factor in her development and mine too. Well, you wrote from the heart and you sang like you meant it. And thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And you still do. You had a great yeah. last night. Thank you. Last night was a wonderful performance. We're going to transition with another video right now. Roland White is center stage. And last night we got to enjoy Roland's great picking and singing. We've got some archival footage from the International Bluegrass Music Museum to honor Roland right here. Here. If we can move this back. Move this back. I think if we just move it back, you could start. Well, oh. walk. We could yeah. just, yeah. I'm not going to Joe, you just move this back. They're okay. going to just try to move that back. Move the monitor back, Roll. Oh, okay. Here. 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 You can see it here on the platform. She has to run you down. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's better, isn't it? Mm. Right. Move the move. No. Uh.
lot of years of great stuff right there, Alden. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly thank the museum team for putting together that beautiful uh, footage for everybody. And yeah. Tell us about Andy Griffith. <laughs> Well, there was this uh, book agent in uh, Southern California. Uh, I'm trying to remember his name now. I had it on top of my head yesterday. We were talking about it. Anyways, uh, uh, Desilu Productions called him. That they want a they wanted uh, a string band for the Andy Griffith show. He says, "Well, I know it's some, it's some the White family." He says, "I can give you their telephone number because he had a phone number." And so he called the house and. Uh, and, and uh, I, my mother answered the phone, and then, anyway, so uh, she says, well, he's here. And uh, so he talked to me. He said, uh, we uh, would like to have you guys come down to Dilsey Lou Productions down in Hollywood and uh, do the Andy Griffith show. And I'd seen the Andy Griffith show once, <laughs> and I thought it was a local TV show. <laughs> So we went down there and I said, I said well, uh, you know, what, what do we wear? I oh, just wear, um, you know, just nice clothes and, uh, and shirt and play. But don't, don't dress up in any way. You just, you know, nice clothes. And so we went down there and got, went backstage and they d directed us to the, uh, to the dressing room. And, uh, and here comes Andy Griffith. And he said, uh, hello, boys, I'm Andy Essence. Uh, yes, how are you? We shook his hand. And he started on that song. We got about, no, oh, probably four bars into it. He says, that'll do, boys. <laughs> <laughs> we never did play the whole thing. He, you know, anyway, so uh, uh, we hung around, and uh, they had, uh, they had, uh, they had a, a, an area where you could leave. Uh, we did it in, uh, in about, oh, two different sections. Uh, we went in and did it one time on the set, and they didn't like what they got, you know. So they said, well, go out to lunch. And so we went to lunch. And after lunch, we'll come back, and if you do it, we'll try it again. It was their problem. Uh, anyway, so we uh, went ahead, went out to lunch, and it was amazing. The people at Disney Productions, all these TV stars that you saw on television. Anyway, so uh, we did the show, got it done, we went home, and when it showed, which was several weeks later, well, four or five weeks later, we get these calls from the state of Maine, where I came from, and my cousin said, we saw you on the Andy Griffith show. I said, really? I thought it was a local, I thought it was a local show. Anyway, so uh, that's, the, that's the way that went. <laughs> well, and I know we've got a few Andy Griffith fans in the audience, and if you recall, uh, the white boys, the country boys, were on that, uh, on that broadcast nationwide before the Dillards. Uh, they were in a couple of those early episodes yes. before the Darlin boys were introduced. Right. You, did you, you did two episodes, didn't you, Roland? Uh, yeah, we, well, I did one, and the other one uh, they did, uh, I was drafted into the army, so I didn't get on that one. Okay, all right, Clarence and, and Leroy so, and the other boys went. There. Right, Clarence, yeah. uh, Eric, Leroy, and Billy Ray. Yeah, yeah. Well, did that do anything for your career? Uh, guess not. Well, <laughs> not, 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 not really, you know. <laughs> It showed once, and that was that was it. You know, I mean, now I see. You know, I have three, or four people here this week tell me they saw us on the Andy Griffith show. You know, yeah, it's a year later. yeah, right. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. Well, we heard some of the story last night in the beautiful induction that, that Jim helped facilitate last night. But what was Nashville like when you showed up? Uh, well, it was not like it is today. <laughs> Uh, uh, Nashville was a very small community. I came here with Bill Monroe. Uh, he came to California to play at the Ash Grove, which is a place that we play frequently. 
And uh, anyway, she called Ed Pearl, who owned the Astro. He says, Ed, he says, I'm flying in with my new fiddle player, which is Byron Berlin. He says, I'm going to need a band. He says, uh, and he had been there before, and we'd had him over for dinner at the house, you know, Bill Monroe and a couple of the guys. Anyways, uh, he said, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need the band. How about the Moy Boys? So anyways, well, he, Ed said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll call Roland and see. So he called me up, and I said, well, uh, what, do, what does he need? He says, well, he needs a guitar player. He needs a bass player. And uh, the whole thing, except for a fiddle player. So uh, we, uh, I called my brother Clarence, and Clarence says, well, I can't do it. He says, I'm real busy right now. She says, I've got a lot of session work. He was in the session work at the time. So he said, uh, uh, call Eric. So I called Eric, and Eric says, yeah, I'd love to do it. OK, so got Eric and myself. And then uh, anyway, so Bill Monroe arrived with, uh, with Byron. And we don't know who played the banjo. Some people say it was Doug Dillard. And some people say it was Ry Cooter. I asked Raikuda, Raikuda about it. He says, well, it could have been. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so we did the show. And, and, and so when the band showed up, Lamar Greer was in the band. James Monroe was in the band on the bass. And uh, Byron was there. And then uh, Bill and Doug Green, or Ranger Doug. He was playing the guitar. And so we played a couple of nights. And as you know, the folk music places, you know, you play, what, four, five, five, six nights, and then you have a day of travel to go to the next one or whatever. Anyway, so <laughs> put that camera away there. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, where was I? Doug Green. Doug Green. Anyways. So uh, Lamar says, you know, we're going to need a guitar player uh, when we, uh, when we, uh, when, uh, when we leave Nashville. I mean, leave Los Angeles. We're going back to Nashville, and uh, you could do the job. You know, I says, well, you know, how about you, your guitar player? He says, well, Ranger Doug, when we get back, he's going back to the University of Michigan. So, anyway, I said. To my wife, she says, "Well, give it a try, you know. uh, and if you like it, you can send it for me." <laughs> anyway, so uh, I took off, got on the bus, and took the clothes that I had, and uh, and uh, drove. We went to Fort Worth, Texas. Well, first we played in San Bernardino, then we played Fort Worth, Texas, I believe it was, and then uh, at Anniston, Alabama, and then Nashville. And uh, anyway, so Nashville was, you know, just a small community. It was, uh, of course, there were all the, the people uh, like Jimmy Martin Band and Bill Monroe, Flat and Scruggs, Osborne Brothers, Jimmy and Jesse. That's about it. And uh, so I got to know all those people. But it was a very small small community for me, you know, I, I I met some other folks who were fans, you know, and stuff. One guy called me up that I was, uh, that, that I knew from the Army from Paducah, Kentucky, and he's still around. I just saw him not long ago. His name was Jack Martin. <laughs> anyway, uh, he, uh, I was playing with Bill Monroe, and Bill Monroe uh, on the Opry, and Bill Monroe says, and did we have over here from the state of Maine, uh, Roland White. Was originally for me. Ain't got that problem yet. So we did a couple songs, and after that was over with, uh, we're going to do another s s song later. And somebody comes to the dressing room and says, Robert, we got a guy who just called you here at the Opry. His name is Jack Martin. I said, Really? Anyway, so I called him back, and then we became friends again. Reconnected. Reconnected, yes. Well, when you got when you left California and you got to Nashville with Bill, was that your first time to play the Opry? Had you been there with the Whites? No. Yeah. No, that was the first time. First time. Yeah. First time. 
fact, I've got, got a video on my phone of me playing with Bill Monroe. <laughs> anyway. You, you was with Bill there in Nashville for a couple years? Uh, yeah, not quite two years. Yeah. Yeah. And then... Uh, Did you tell him you wanted the mandolin job? <laughs> <laughs> no, but he would let me play his mandolin on the bus. <laughs> and I couldn't play it because the action was that high. <laughs> I, find, I finally got to, we finally took the, um, Randy Wood was in Nashville at the time, and he was built, he had built a couple of mandolins, and uh, he, uh, I talked Bill into taking it to Randy Wood, because the neck had pulled out of it just a tiny, tiny bit, just a little bit, and uh, so it, it caused the action to be too high, and Bill just played it that way. You know, and every time somebody tried to pick it up and play, it, said, oh, I can't play this. And you couldn't. You couldn't. It's amazing. Anyway, so Randy would set the neck, set the neck back, and it was just fine. Yeah. How'd you transition to Lester Flats band? Well, I left Bill Monroe's band, and uh, one day I was uh, uh, on Thanksgiving, uh, just around Thanksgiving time, and I went. To, to the WSM studios because I'd been up there to see Flat and Scruggs tape their TV shows. And uh, I went up there and uh, got there early and pulled up in the parking lot and there was Lester Flat just pulling in. He said, oh, hello, Roland, what are you doing here? I said, well, I came over here to chat with you. Well, come on in. You know, I'd been there before. And uh, he said, um, got in the dressing room and they brought him some coffee and I had some cup of coffee and we got to talking. I says, uh, you know, did, uh, did you ever consider using a mandolin player in your band again? He says, well, I'm going to tell you something. Don't you tell anybody. He says, but after the first of the year, there were some big changes made in this band and I might just call you. Okay. And uh, so, what year was that? Uh, 68? 1968. Yeah, right. Anyway, so uh, he says, but don't stay on your job, you know. He says, because, you know, I might, I might not even call you, but. <laughs> anyway, so we, uh, so, uh, here comes New Year's weekend, and we're playing the opera. Bill Monroe says, uh, Roland, uh, we're going to Europe. I said, we are. When are you going? In January. Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. So I stayed on. We went to Europe, came back. And we stayed at Tex Logan's house there in uh, Madison, New Jersey. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we, we drove the bus up there. We did a couple of gigs on the way up, drove the bus up there. And uh, they took us to the airport, and we flew to uh, Italy first. And uh, <laughs> oh, I'm not going to tell that one. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> there, there, were, there, there were slot machines in, in a place that we went. And Bill and Rose threw some money in there, and he won five hundred dollars. <laughs> How he did that, I don't know. But anyway, anyways, uh, so we did a trip down, you know, went to Italy. We went to, gosh, England, uh, Holland, Belgium. Uh, then to England, so I said that already, and Wales, and we came home. And so we're at Tex Logan's house. We're going to spend a couple of days there because we had some gigs on the way back to town. So I asked Peggy. Uh, is it Peggy? Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, I says, uh, could I use your telephone? I want to call home, tell my wife we're back. She says, well, go upstairs in the bedroom up there. And she said, uh, it's a, you know, it's quiet up there, and you can use that phone. I says, OK, well, I'll, I'll call collect, OK? Oh, no, 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 don't you worry about it. I said, Anyway, so I called home and told her, I says, well, we're back. She says, oh, you are? I says, yes. She says, I'll be going just fine. I says, Lester called. I says, really? 
what's going on? She says, oh, you didn't hear, did you? I says, no. She says, well, the flat scrubs broke up. And I dropped the phone, clunk, 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 <laughs> phone on the floor. I says, no, that can't be. There's been the flat scrubs all my life. What? What do you mean? She says, no, he called. He says, for you to just stay on your job until you get home, and when you get home, you can call him. And I've got a phone number here. So, uh, anyways, we did a couple of gigs, I don't know, Baltimore or something. Washington, D.C. or Baltimore, I'll forget now. And uh, anyways, we you know, made our way back to Nashville. And so when I get home, I call Lester and he says, uh, I'm rolling, he says, uh, I guess you heard, haven't you? I said, well, yes, I did. I said, well, what's going on? He says, oh, that's a long story. I'll tell you about it sometime. He says, you stay on your job. He says, uh, we've, got a, uh, we've, got, we've got a couple more. Uh, we've got a, a lot of, we've got a, a, he had an attorney. And, you know, to make everything, you know, legalize everything and all. So uh, he says, I'll, I'll call you in a couple of weeks, maybe. But stay on, probably won't do anything till March. So uh, I get a phone call in March from Uncle Josh. Uncle Josh just lives just not far in Madison, New Jersey there. On Caldwell Avenue, he lives just not far. And I've been in his house a few times. And uh, so anyways, uh, Lester calls me up. He says, uh, uh, Josh is going to give you a phone call. Uh, we're going to get together at Josh's house. Do you know where it is? I says, well, yeah, I've been there. He says, OK. So anyways, the day comes, and I get this call from Josh. He says, come on over this afternoon. What are you doing today? I says, well, nothing, really. So uh, he says, well, come on over. So anyways, I go over there, and I pull up. I parked on the street. like I always come from this way and parked on the street off the street. And who pulls up behind me but Victor Jordan? who was in Bill's band also. Oh, wow. <laughs> I said, Vic, what are you doing here? He says, what are you doing here? I said, I hadn't told anybody about this. He says, well, I think I've got a job. I says, well, I think I do too. <laughs> Let's go in there and see. Then <laughs> Paul Warren shows up. Then Cousin Jake shows up. Then finally Lester shows up. And Charles was there, so we go over a couple of tunes, and Lester says, okay, boys, we start, we'll put you on the payroll. And that was the first time I ever had a, a guaranteed pay, weekly pay, was from Lester Flat. Whether you worked or not, but I'm going to tell you what, we worked. <laughs> I mean, he traveled everywhere, we did the Martha White shows, and it was just amazing, the work we did. Uh, and Martha White was the sponsor. But then, anyways, that's the way it went. Well, it's a big chunk of history right there. Just that, just yeah, that last story right there. <laughs> well, I know it. Looking at, across the, uh, the the demographic of our room, there are so many folks here that were huge fans of the Country Gazette and the NBB, and and I, I see a lot of folks here that still get to hang out with you and. And Diane down in Nashville, the station in, it's, it's been a wonderful.